So I invite you to open your Bibles to the book of 1 John. Uh, we've been working our way through the book of 1 John together, and we've now reached the middle of chapter 3. And uh, we'll be reading some of those verses beginning at verse 11. You're welcome to stand up for a couple of minutes if you'd like as we read from God's Word. So 1 John chapter 3 and verse 11. For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. You may be seated. We talked before that one of the recurring topics in John's letter is this one here, that Christians ought to love other Christians. And in fact, if you do not love other Christians, then you're not a real Christian yourself. So we've talked about most of these verses uh, in a previous sermon, but there's something else here that deserves our attention today. It's a statement in verse 13, do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. It's interesting that in the midst of a discussion about love, The Apostle John inserts something about hatred, the hatred of the world. And he gives an example of the kind of hatred he has in mind, the example of Cain, who killed his brother Abel. A few weeks ago, we talked about about our attitude toward the world. That It says in, in, in 1 John, we should not love the world or the things in the world. But now things get reversed. And we're being told about the world's attitude toward us. What's the world's attitude? Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. Remember when John speaks about the world in his letter, and this comes up a lot of times, he does not mean the the rocks and trees and bunny rabbits out there. That is not the world, the natural world he's talking about. There's nothing wrong with rocks and trees and bunny rabbits. Uh, John is talking instead about the moral environment, the spiritual environment of our world in its present fallen state. He's talking about um, the evil moral system that is opposed to Christ, that in, 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 in so many words is saying over and over, you do not need God, or at least you do not need the God of the Bible. And you'll be just fine without him. That's the message of the world. This evil system is under the control of Satan himself. That dragon we heard about earlier. And it's pretty clear that Satan has his fingers in a lot of the big institutions of America in these days. Government, education, business, entertainment, and so on. These institutions seem to be opposed to God because unsaved humanity in general is opposed to God. And the world opposes us believers as well. The world is not your friend, brother. Is this vile world a friend to grace to help us on to God? I thought of that line from Isaac Watts. No, it's not our friend. Rather, we can expect its hatred And John's point here is that this conflict between the Christians and the world is not something new. It goes all the way back to the very beginning of creation, the very beginning of human history. Back to Cain and Abel. Now, it's probably been a while since some of us read Genesis chapter 4. And so so before we go any further, let's just turn back there uh, to Genesis and get clear on this story of Cain and Abel. Uh, that John is is making reference to. So in Genesis chapter 4, right at the beginning of the chapter, 
Uh, this is right after Adam and Eve have sinned. They've been driven out of the Garden of Eden. And it says, Genesis 4, verse 1, Now the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I've gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. Again, she gave birth to his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. Let's pause here for just a minute. See, both brothers are attempting to worship God. They both bring offerings to present to God. Cain Cain, he's, a, he's, the, he's the tiller of the ground. He's doing that kind of farming. And he brings an offering of, of some, some vegetables or some crops that he has raised. He brings that and presents that to God. Abel, who has, who's in the sheep business, he brings, he brings one, of his, one of his sheep and offers that to God here. And it says God was pleased with Abel's offering with the sheep, but not with Cain's offering. And so the question everybody has here is, did Cain know? Did Cain know the kind of offering he was supposed to bring? Didn't know. Well, we're given a big clue in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, it says, By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain. It says that the crucial ingredient that caused Abel to give the right sacrifice was faith. Biblical faith is always in some truth that God has revealed. Faith is not just a nebulous feeling. It's faith in something. God has said certain things and I believe what God says. I act upon that revelation from God. And so most scholars that I'm aware of anyway um, infer that God must have previously revealed to Adam and Eve or Cain and Abel, uh, that he wanted blood sacrifices and not vegetable offerings. Abel believed what God said and he acted in faith. He says, okay, Lord, if you want that, I'll bring you just what you want. His brother Cain, on the other hand, just kind of did his own thing. He says, I'm going to offer what I want. Well, let's keep reading in verse 5. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. So now he's all grouchy and sullen. You can see it on his face. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. Isn't God merciful here in coming to Cain like this? Entreating Cain, Cain, just do well. Just repent. Just do the right thing. It'll be okay. Or else sin is going to get you. It's going to destroy you. How does Cain respond to God's mercy? Verse 8, Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And he says, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? He said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. So that is the story that the Apostle John is referencing in his his letter. He's saying that Cain's hatred toward his brother is parallel to the world's hatred toward Christians. Well, I just have a simple outline uh, for us to, to work through this morning from these, these verses in 1 John. Three aspects of the world's hatred that's taught here. Uh, first, the likelihood of the hatred. Uh, secondly, the cause of the hatred. And then the intensity of the hatred. So we'll start with its likelihood. 
the likelihood of it. Back, back to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 13. He says, do not be surprised. Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. This should not come as a shock. If this happens, if you experience the world's rejection or even some form of persecution toward you, this should not shock you. It should not surprise you. He says we should expect it. Now I'm sure that Abel, in the story we just read, I'm sure Abel was totally surprised when he realized to his horror that his own brother was attacking him with horrible intent. Such a thing had never happened before, right? But we are not in Abel's position. We have all this history to look at. And more importantly, we have all this scripture to look at that tells us we should not be surprised. Such things happen. They happen a lot. It's all through the Bible. I mean, you have Joseph hated by his own brothers. You have David hated by King Saul. You have Daniel thrown in the lion's den. You have Daniel's three friends thrown into the fiery furnace. You have many of the Old Testament prophets get murdered. John the Baptist comes along. He's imprisoned and then killed. Um, Stephen gets stoned to death. Uh, Most of the New Testament apostles get martyred. And the book of Hebrews summarizes all this history. The end of Hebrews chapter 11, it says, it says, others were tortured not accepting their release so they might obtain a better resurrection. Others experience mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins, in goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy. It's been the history of God's people. Down through the centuries. And Jesus himself warned us repeatedly that we should expect just this kind of thing. Matthew 10 verse 21. He says, he says, brother will betray brother to death and a father, his child and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name. And then later on, Matthew 24, verse 9, Jesus says, Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Again, Luke 21, verse 12, he says, uh, again, this is Jesus speaking. He says, Before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and will persecute you you then jesus prayer for us in in john 17 he he mentions this so john 17 verse 14 he says i have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world even as i am not of the world the apostle paul writing to timothy summarizes the situation second timothy 3 verse 12 saying indeed all who desire to live godly in christ jesus will be persecuted all will be persecuted he says and yet despite all this scripture it still kind of shocks us when we experience even a little bit of hatred ourselves for being christians And and I think some of that shock is is because we're Americans. We live in a country where where Christianity has been the dominant religion in the past, where religious freedom is enshrined in our Constitution. We're not used to having much trouble with this stuff. But don't you sense that the cultural and political tide has turned against us in some ways? Don't you expect there will be more trouble that way? There will be more restrictions, harassment, different kinds toward believers from the government, the business, other institutions. So we might think of kind of that bigger picture, but, but, but the world's hatred doesn't just come from like big institutions. It comes through individuals, even individuals really close to us. That's where we experience it the most, I think. Abel got killed by who? 
Not by the government, his, his own brother. His own brother turned on him. You could be hated by your own unsaved family members just because you're a Christian. That happens sometimes, Christians. Maybe you even have stories yourself. That's what Jesus talked about in Matthew 10, verse 34. He says, do not think I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. I came to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Those are strong words, aren't they? Christian children may get disowned by their parents who follow a different religion. We hear stories about that. Different times, you know. People in other countries. Or maybe somebody gets saved and their spouse leaves them. It's like, hey, I didn't sign up to be married to a religious wacko. I'm out of here. That happens. Or maybe your old friends turn on you. And they're not your friends anymore. First, first Peter chapter 4 and, and verse 4 talks about, talks about this. He describes all these sins that we used to do when we, were, when we were lost. And now we've become Christians. And he says, and those people we used to sin with, he says, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation. And they malign you. Ah, oh, did you hear about Jimmy? Jimmy's got religion now. So he doesn't party with us anymore. We're not good enough for him. What a jerk that Jimmy is. See, Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you in one of these ways. The second thing that's brought out in the text is the cause. The cause of this hatred. Why? Why would Christians be hated? By the world. I mean, I mean, most of the time when somebody's mad at you, you know, your boss or your mom or your wife or your neighbor, somebody's mad at you, it's because you did something wrong or at least you did something highly questionable. Okay, And they're responding to that. But Abel died for just the opposite reason, didn't he? He died for doing what was right. He died for being good, for being holy. He died for righteousness. That's what it says in verse 12. It says, not as Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Cain hated Abel because Abel was good. Abel was living by faith, right? We talked about that. He's trying to just do things God's way. Lord, if you want this sacrifice, I'll just give you that. Whatever sacrifice you want, I'm happy to do that. And he's receiving God's favor and blessing. But Cain envied his more righteous brother. He resented that holiness. And, and rather than, than, than Cain repenting himself and joining his brother on the righteousness team... He said, he says, I'm going to get rid of that brother. I'm going to get rid of the one who keeps exposing my sin. And that's what he did. But did you know that the same thing happened to the Lord Jesus? I mean, why did the world hate Jesus Christ? I mean, even, even the good people that we know still sin and mess up some of the time. But the Lord Jesus never did anything at all wrong. Never wronged anybody. Not even a tiny amount. He didn't even think a rotten thought against anybody. No, the Bible says Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. He was just doing good stuff all the time. And yet what happens? They hated him and they killed him. He explains it in, uh, in, in John 3, verse 19. He says, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men loved the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. 
For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Here this this light burst into this dark scene. And rather than embracing the light and rejoicing and saying, 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 hallelujah, the light has come at last. Instead, the response of most people to Jesus Christ is let's squelch the light. Let's stomp it out. Let's get rid of it. Why? Because it exposed their own sin. Friends, that's how we all are before we are saved. I mean, this is where we all started out. It's that attitude. Romans 8 verse 7 says, The mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. Nobody's neutral about God. You know, you pretend to be neutral. Yeah, I just, I'm, just, I'm just trying to figure out the truth there. No, deep down, we hate God. We're, it's an enmity against Him. We might like some made-up God. You know, sometimes people will make up a different version of God that they like better. But when it comes to the God of the Bible, no, there's an enmity. There's a hostility toward Him. We hate the light. That's where we naturally are apart from grace. And the world, if the world hates believers, it hates us because we are Christians. Because of Christ. We're hated for Christ's sake. It's it's because we draw attention to Jesus. It's because we talk about Jesus. It's because we reflect some aspect of Jesus. However imperfectly, we're still showing some aspect of Christ. And it's that Christ-likeness. It's that Christ-centered message that the world hates, that gets us in trouble. Jesus talked about this in John 15 and verse 18. He says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before, hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. So the word, the world doesn't really care about us personally. The world, the world hates us because we're representatives of Jesus. Because we're connected to Jesus. I mean, he's, he's the one they've got the real problem with. The world, see, doesn't mind If you just want to be a good person, if you want to go off and do good and noble things, you know, you want to you want to volunteer at the soup kitchen, we'll applaud you for that. You want to go over to Africa and drill water wells for them. Oh, that's wonderful. You're such a good person. You you want to donate a lot of money and add a wing to the hospital. You're great, great going. Until you bring Jesus into the picture. Until you say, no, actually, this is all about the gospel. I'm I'm drilling water wells because I want people to know Jesus. You know, it's all connected with Christ. I'm doing this as a Christian. Now the friction starts. Now the difficulty comes in. So the issue is over Christ. A lively Christian can make worldly people feel condemned without them ever opening their mouths and criticizing anybody. Just being around a holy person can make you feel kind of dirty yourself. Exposes us. A spirit-filled believer who just loves God and is full of joy and is just trying their best to follow Jesus. Kind of exposes the people around them that are not like that. They're not living for God. Makes lost people feel unholy. I say there's like a friction there. And, and you know what? Unsaved people who are religious are the ones who feel the most friction. Think about that. It's the religious people. I mean, that's what Cain was, right? Cain was a religious guy. This whole dispute between him and his brother was over what's the right way to worship God? Same deal with the Lord Jesus, right? Who led the opposition against Jesus? It was not the atheist. It was not the Roman pagans. It 
was the scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees. He was the leaders, the religious crowd. Even old Pilate figured that out. He, Pilate says he knew, he knew that because of envy they had handed him over. Pilate could see through it. This wasn't some noble religious endeavor. They were just bothered by Jesus exposing them. Unsaved religious people realize that that, that, that happy, holy Christian over there has got something they don't have. He's got real life. He's got a real relationship with God. And it sometimes makes them envious and resentful toward that Christian. They want to tear him down. See? So that's the cause of the hatred. The cause is righteousness. And then that leaves us with one more. Thing to cover and that is the intensity of the hatred how strong is this Cain didn't just yell at Abel did he he didn't just slap him around a little bit no he planned I'm going to take him out I'm going to take him out in the woods I'm going to kill him the Greek word that John uses here for that word slay literally means butcher it's like John's wanting to get there. There's a shocking amount of violence in this story. Totally unexpected. And John picks up that again down in verse 15. says, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. You know no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So the hatred of the world can come out in actions. It's not just, it's not just that they're, they're thinking stuff, but it comes out in, in different actions toward Christians at times. And those actions might be surprisingly strong. I mean, there are times you say, whoa, where'd that come from? Well, it actually came from Satan. That's what verse 12 points out here. It says, verse 12, that Cain, it says, was of the evil one. Cain didn't act alone. He was, he was influenced by the evil one. Again, that, that dragon we heard about today from Revelation, he was, he was involved in this. Jesus, Jesus said something similar actually to those who were rejecting Him in John 8, verse 44. He says, you are of your father the devil and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning. I think he's thinking about Cain and Abel. He's also thinking about the fall, Adam and Eve. And Satan can influence lost people to become irrationally evil in their treatment of Christians. Maybe you've seen that. Maybe you know stories like that. It's like it made no logical sense for Cain to kill Abel. It's like, what had Abel done to him? It wasn't Abel's fault that Cain wouldn't do the right sacrifice. He didn't say that Abel was like making fun of him or whatever, right? It made no sense. Persecution today makes no sense either. I mean, Christians tend to be the best of citizens. They're the ones getting in trouble the least. Those that love Jesus the most, they tend to do the most good. Christians tend to be the best employees. Christians tend to be the best spouses. And so on. So why give them a hard time for being Christian? It makes no sense. See, it makes just as little sense as that Passover crowd in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago saying, crucify Jesus and give us Barabbas instead. They're saying, kill the one who's done nothing but good for the last three years. Instead, give us this violent criminal. Turn him Barabbas loose instead. See, it makes no sense. It's the power of that, that inner animosity. In Pilgrim's Progress, you know that, that classic allegory book, 
In the way Bunyan writes the story, the Christians have to go through a place called Vanity Fair in order to get to heaven. And Vanity Fair is symbolic of the world in, in, in Bunyan's, Bunyan's story. And, and these believers going through Vanity Fair, they're just trying to get through town peacefully. You know? They're not going out their way to be rabble-rousers or whatever, but they get noticed it says, it says because their, their clothing look different and their speech look different and their values are so different from the Vanity Fair people that folks pick up on that and they're bothered by that differentness. They're bothered by these people do not care about the Vanity Fair stuff as en enough, you know. They don't fit in. And so they, they end up getting insulted and then attacked and finally arrested. And, and one of the Christian guys in the story named Faithful, he's put on this sham trial with these really crazy accusations that make no sense. But he gets convicted, mercilessly tortured, and killed. Right there in Vanity Fair. I read that chapter again this week and thought of this. And it is... It is just, it's, a, it's chilling because it dramatizes exactly what we're talking about here. The world's attitude toward Christians can, can just go way beyond what seems reasonable. I've, I've heard it asserted that more Christians have been killed for their faith in the, in the 20th century than in all the previous centuries of church history put together and I have, I have no way to verify that calculation how do you even calculate such a thing um, but but the point is clear that martyrs blood is still being spilled all over the world and if anything it's being spilled at a faster rate now than it has been in the past this is real this is going on everywhere these things we're reading about here in the Bible this happens. It's like our, our technology, our technology has gotten better and better over the centuries, but this aspect of fallen human nature is still exactly the same as everything we read in Scripture. Of course, of course, most of the persecution we've had in America has been extremely mild over the last 200 years. Maybe, maybe you get laughed at at school for saying you're a Christian or quoting the Bible. Maybe you'll be put out of your friend group and kind of ostracized that way. Maybe you'll have some grouchy family members at Thanksgiving dinner that don't like you because you're Christian now. That's possible. Maybe you get spit on. You're trying to do street witnessing. That happens occasionally. Um, maybe you don't get that promotion at work. Because the guy who makes the decision has something against Christians. That happens. But what if things do get worse here? What if they do get worse? Maybe, maybe things are moving in that direction. Or it's getting worse. I think, I think most Christians think so. What, what if there were, there were widespread job losses for Christians? Where you know, the conclusion is made, people that really believe the Bible are just intolerant. They're bad employees. You need to get rid of them. And there's that kind of direct economic consequence for being a Christian. What if pastors are being arrested for hate speech? Just for you know, saying what the Bible says about stuff that's unpopular. That, that happens in some countries. What if it's happening here? What, what if kids are being taken away from parents who are, are simply practicing you know, like biblical discipline in their home? What if, what if things got worse, you see? What about you? Would you still be a Christian? Would you still be a Christian in that situation? What if it was worse than that? What if, what if you lived in a place where, where some Christians do live? But what if you lived in a place where, where you knew that, 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 that if I convert to Christianity, there's a 30% chance I'm going to end up in prison and a 10% chance I'm going to end up dead? Would you still become a Christian? Would you weigh that? Would you count that cost? You know, we're not talking, you know, no longer we're thinking about, well, maybe my friends will laugh at me. But the cost of being a Christian can be extreme. <clears throat> Would you still be a Christian? Would Christ still be worth it in that situation? 
you know, our friends from Eritrea. You know, all the, they, they locked up all the pastors. They're still in prison over there if they're even alive. That's real. That happens. Down the road, I suspect, we'll feel more pressure to compromise in different ways. Compr- you know, it's like if you just compromise on these aspects of unpopular biblical truth, then, then you'll be all right and you'll, we, won't, we won't be so hard on you. Will we compromise? Will we abandon our faith entirely when the pressure comes? The Bible says many will do that. Many will give in to that pressure. Sadly, Jesus talked about it in you know, the, his parable, the sower and the soils. He talks about the rocky ground converts there. Now, I'm reading from Mark's account, Mark 7, 14. He says they have no firm root in themselves. They are only temporary And then when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they fall away. See, this persecution can push somebody to the point where they just give up the whole thing. I'm not going to be a Christian. It's going to cost that. It's not worth that. The intensity of things is going to have an effect. Well, three aspects of being hated by the world. The likelihood of it, don't be surprised. The cause of it, actually for righteousness sake. The intensity of it, even all the way to murder that we see here. Well, this is a pretty dark topic, isn't it? (laughs) Well, I'm not going to quit today without talking for a few minutes about the gospel. So let's end with something good. You realize that Cain, the bad guy in the story... He actually, like I said before, he represents all of us apart from God's saving grace. I mean, I hope you see yourself in Cain. Like him, we're all born with a bent towards sin. Like him, we're born with a, with a heart that tends to be rotten and hateful. And, and, and we naturally hide from the light. We naturally push away the holy people. We're bothered by it. That's how we naturally are. But God comes to us in mercy. I pointed out how he came so mercifully to Cain. Cain, the bad guy. But God comes to him and entreats him. Cain, if you just repent, he warns him, the sin will destroy you. God comes to us in mercy. God is calling all of us sinners to repent and be saved before their sin destroys them. What a mercy. The good news of the gospel. There's a precious verse in in Hebrews chapter 12 that I thought of this week talking about Abel. Hebrews 12 verse 24. uh, It says that, that as believers we come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. The blood of Jesus speaks better things than the blood of Abel. What did the blood of Abel say? You know, God says, your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. What was it saying? What was that blood calling for? It's calling for justice. It's calling for retribution. That blood is saying, I've been murdered. There's a murderer out there. And he's my brother Cain. And he deserves punishment for that. That's what Abel's blood is saying. Cry for justice. What is Jesus' blood saying? Jesus' blood is saying justice has already been satisfied. It's already been satisfied. Jesus' blood is the innocent dying for the guilty. Jesus died for my sins there on the cross. And so his blood cries for mercy on sinners. His blood it says, I am suffering for rotten sinners like you. I'm to make a way that you can be right with God, that you can be forgiven. That you can have your sins washed away. But Christians don't just get forgiveness when they get saved. They also get new hearts. God changes us on the inside too. That's part of the gospel as well. The Holy Spirit begins living within us. The Holy Spirit changes us. And the Holy Spirit gives us a faith that is strong enough. To endure 
really hard things if we have to. I mean, we, we, we read these stories in history and we just feel so pathetically weak. You say, well, my, would my faith hold up if I went through that? What's our hope? It's the power of God in us. God, by His Spirit, has changed us enough to enable us to endure hatred, persecution, whatever might come. But even beyond that, His heart has changed us so much that we can do what Jesus says and love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. That's even a bigger miracle, isn't it? We don't just endure. We turn around and we love them. We pray for the ones that are hurting us. Those people that laugh at you in your classroom for being a Christian. You pray for them. You love them. right? You want them to know Jesus also. So on. What a glorious change God makes in our hearts. Our hope for faithfully enduring the rejection of the world, whatever form that comes to us, our hope for, for enduring is not our own toughness. <laughs> it's not our own willpower. I'll power through this. You can't stop me. No, it's the power of the gospel. It's the power of God's grace reigning in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Supernatural grace. That's our hope. Amen.